Hello, welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today we are going to discuss the important issues appearing in the New Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 10th January 2020. The news to be discussed has been displayed on your screen and time timing for the same has been provided in the description box below. So let's start our today's discussion. The first news appears on page number 2. It says, find out whether automated plants can address pollution. Green Panel directed Central Pollution Control Board to carry out study within 4 months, where the NGT has directed National Environmental Engineering Research Institute and Indian Institute of Technology Delhi to carry out this particular study. Now this news becomes important from our prelims perspective as it mentions about pyrolysis. So in this news let us understand about pyrolysis as well as its various industrial application. The newspaper says that pyrolysis is a method of recycling old tires through a thermochemical treatment under high temperature and this is done to produce industrial oil and other matters. So pyrolysis essentially refers to chemical decomposition of organic materials through application of heat and it occurs in the absence of oxygen. So we can say that pyrolysis in this regard is very different from combustion because combustion uses oxygen and pyrolysis takes place in the absence of oxygen. So pyrolysis is effectively an endothermic reaction whereby high energy is maintained in the new content which is formed and the rate of pyrolysis increases with that of the temperature. So more the temperature rises more is the rate of pyrolysis and in the process of pyrolysis it produces solid, liquid as well as non-condensable gases. Examples of solid becomes charcoal and biochar whereas examples of gas becomes hydrogen, methane, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide as well as nitrogen. Now it says that this thermal decomposition leads to the formation of new molecules and this allows to receive products with a different and often more superior character than the original residue and it is because of the concept of endothermic reaction as the newly content formed through the pyrolysis has very high energy because of endothermic reaction. So in this regard it says that pyrolysis allows to bring far greater value to common materials and waste. So effectively these are some of the important aspects with respect to pyrolysis. Now another important aspect highlighted here is about pyrolysis of biomass and Pyrolysis of biomass produces three products namely liquid, gas as well as solid. So pyrolysis of biomass produces bio oil, biochar as well as syngas. Now here application of pyrolysis with respect to bio oil becomes important as bio oil can be used as a low grade diesel oil. Further biochar is the solid material which is created in the process of pyrolysis and biochar is currently promoted for its potential to improve soil properties as well as fertility including carbon sequestration. So biochar becomes an important product with respect to increasing fertility of the soil. Now another product of pyrolysis of biomass are syngas. Syngas are permanent gases which remains after pyrolysis process is complete. And this syngas such as carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, hydrogen as well as light hydrocarbons can be used in place of natural gas or and it can be converted with catalysts to form ethanol. Now as we have already discussed that by increasing the temperature the rate of pyrolysis increases. So in this regard it says that there are two types of pyrolysis systems. First, fast pyrolysis optimizes bio oil production by increasing the rate of pyrolysis temperature to around 1000 degrees Celsius per second. So this process whereby temperature is increased to around 1000 degrees Celsius per second yields approximately 60 to 70% bio oil 
15 to 25 percent biochar and around 10 to 15 percent of syngas. Now this process is contrasted with slow pyrolysis process that is slow increase of temperature whereby through slow heating rates biochar becomes the major end products. Whereas with respect to fast pyrolysis where very high temperature is obtained it obtains around 60 to 70 percent of bio oil. So these are some of the important aspects which we must remember with respect to pyrolysis of biomass as well as fast and slow pyrolysis of biomass as fast pyrolysis of biomass yields more bio oil. Now NCRT defines pyrolysis as higher alkanes on heating to higher temperature decompose into lower alkanes, alkenes etc and such a decomposition reaction into smaller fragments by the application of heat is called pyrolysis or cracking. As you can see C6H14 when applied with heat at 773 degree Kelvin then it results into C6H12 and hydrogen, C4H8 as well as C2H6 and C3H6, C2H4 as well as methane. So another important point to be highlighted is that on pyrolysis higher alkanes on heating get converted into lower alkanes or alkenes. So some of the industrial application of pyrolysis can be said to be with respect to biomass, conversion of sludge, burning tires at the end of their life, converting waste plastics into usable products and converting waste to energy including municipal waste. So these can be said to be some of the industrial application of pyrolysis. So all these aspects with respect to pyrolysis becomes important for us from a perspective of general science as well as science and technology under GS paper 3. Now this news highlights about an institute whereby the NGT has directed National Environmental Engineering Research Institute in collaboration with IIT Delhi to conduct the research. So this particular National Environmental Engineering Research Institute is a constituent laboratory of Council of Scientific and Industrial Research that is CSIR. So the mandate of NIRI is to conduct research and developmental studies in environmental science and engineering, to render assistance to the industries of the region, local bodies etc. in order to solve the problems of environmental pollution through science and technology intervention, to interact and collaborate with academic and research institutions on environmental science and engineering from mutual benefit and to participate in various CSIR thrust area and national mission projects. So effectively the thrust area for research and development for national environmental engineering research institutes are environmental monitoring, environmental modeling, optimization, environmental impact and risk assessment, environmental policy, environmental biotechnology, genomics and virology, environmental health, water and watershed technologies, solid and hazardous waste management and environmental materials. So these are some of the important aspects which we must remember about National Environmental Engineering Research Institute. So in this news analysis we learned certain basic facts about pyrolysis as well as about National Environmental Engineering Research Institute which is a constituent laboratory of CSIR. The next news appears on page number 7. It says declare Goa sanctuaries as tiger reserve activist. State government must follow a proposal sent to center in 2017. Now this news highlights that activists and politicians from Goa have demanded that certain areas in wildlife sanctuaries of the state shall be notified as a tiger. And in this regard the state government has sent a proposal and has demarcated around 500 square kilometer of area which includes Mahadai sanctuary, Netravali sanctuary and Kotigao sanctuary to be designated as a tiger reserve. Now it's important to note that in the entire state of Goa there is no tiger reserve. Whereas nearby in the state of Karnataka almost on the borders there is a tiger reserve named Dandeli Anshi. So in this backdrop this particular aspect becomes very important to understand for your prelims point of view. 
not only about tiger reserve but also about dandeli anshi as a tiger reserve in the state of karnataka so in this news analysis let us understand about tiger reserve who designates tiger reserve and what are the powers of state government to ensure that the central government notify certain area as tiger reserve now as you can see in this map this is a state of goa and this is where the mahadai wildlife sanctuary is situated and this is where netravali wildlife sanctuary is there and this is koti gao so the state government of goa has notified around an area of around 500 square kilometer to be designated as tiger reserve and if you can see in this map this is where dandeli anshi tiger reserve is which is in the state of karnataka so this particular tiger reserve becomes an important aspect from your prelims perspective now this news also becomes important as this particular wildlife sanctuary lies amid the mahadai river and this mahadai river has currently been in news with respect to its dispute with respect to karnataka so all these backdrop makes this particular mahadai wildlife sanctuary very important from our prelims perspective Now the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 says that tiger reserve means the area notified as such under section 38V and under section 38V state has authority to notify any area as tiger reserve and such area which is notified by the state shall then be approved by the National Tiger Conservation Authority so in this regard let us go through the important aspect of section 38v of wildlife protection act and also certain important powers and functions of national tiger conservation authority so section 38v mentions about a tiger conservation plan it says that the state government shall on the recommendation of tiger conservation authority notify an area as a tiger reserve so in this regard the state government shall prepare a tiger conservation plan and this tiger conservation plan shall also include staff deployment and also deployment plan for proper management of each of the areas referred with respect to this tiger conservation plan now this tiger conservation plan prepared by the state government helps in the following aspects first of all this is done to ensure protection of tiger reserve and it also provides site specific habitat inputs for a viable population of tigers further it also ensures that the natural pre predator ecological cycle in a tiger reserve is maintained and it is not disturbed or distorted further such a plan ensures ecological compatible land use in such a tiger reserve and it also helps in not only identifying the areas and it also helps in linking one protected area or tiger reserve to that of other protected area and this linking of one protected area to another it not only helps in addressing the livelihood concerns of local population but also acts as a conduit or a passage for dispersal or movement of such population of wild animals from one protected area to another protected area or from a tiger reserve to another protected area further such link or such conduit of passage also helps in spilling the overpopulation of wild animals from designated core areas of tiger reserves or from such area of tiger reserve which has been categorized for tiger breeding habitats further such identification of tiger conservation plan also help the officials of forest to carry out their day to day forestry operations so these can be said to be some of the benefit of preparing a tiger conservation plan with respect to a particular tiger reserve so after understanding the tiger conservation plan let us also go through some of the important powers and functions of national tiger conservation authority now an important point to be noted about ntca is that it is headed by minister of environment forest and climate change so in this aspect 
the national tiger conservation authority shall have the following powers and functions so the first important function of ntca is that it approves the tiger conservation plan prepared by state government further it evaluates as well as assesses various aspects of sustainable ecology and thereby either allows or disallow any ecologically unsustainable land use such as mining industry as well as other industrial project activities within the tiger reserves another important aspect is that the ntca lays down normative standards for tourism activities further it also lays down guidelines with respect to preservation and conservation of tiger in the buffer and core area of tiger reserves next the ntca addresses conflicts of men and wild animals and it also emphasizes on coexistence in forest areas outside the national parks sanctuaries or tiger reserve next the ntca provide information with respect to protection measures including future conservation plans estimation of population of tiger as well as its natural prey species status of habitats disease surveillance in the area mortality survey about patrolling events as well as any other reports with respect to any happening around the area of forest and any management aspects which the ntca deems necessary for future plan conservation of tiger reserve next the authority coordinates research and monitoring on tiger co predators prey habitat related ecological and socio economic parameters as well as their evaluation further the authority ensures that the passage connecting two different tiger reserves or protected areas are not diverted or not misutilized for unsustainable ecological uses and if it is done it must be done in public interest and with the approval of national board for wildlife and also on the advice of tiger conservation authority further the conservation authority must facilitate and support tiger reserve management in the state for biodiversity conservation initiatives and this must be done through eco development and people's participation further the authority provides critical input and support with respect to scientific information technology and legal support and this is done for better implementation of tiger conservation plan the conservation authority also facilitates skill building program or skill development program of its officers and staffs in order to ensure that tiger reserves are protected and perform any other activities which the authority deems necessary with respect to conservation of tigers as well as their habitats so these can be said to be some of the important powers and functions of tiger conservation authority and this becomes very important to understand and remember from your prelims as well as mains perspective now after understanding the functions of tiger conservation authority let us learn certain basic facts about dandeli anshi tiger reserve now dandeli anshi tiger reserve is also known as kali tiger reserve and this is a protected area as well as a tiger reserve and this is located in karnataka in the district of uttar kannada and this tiger reserve has been spread over an area of around 1300 square kilometers now the name of the kali tiger reserves originate from the river kali which flows through the tiger reserve further the dandeli anshi tiger reserve is known for its habitat of bengal tigers black panthers as well as indian elephants now with respect to kali river or kali nadi as it is commonly known it flows through uttara kannada district of karnataka and it rises near digi which is a small place in uttar kannada district now this river is said to be the lifeline of the area where it flows now there are many dams which has been built across the kali nadi or the kali river for the generation of electricity and one such important dam built across kali river is the supa dam at ganesh gudi 
This river runs the course of around 184 kilometers and joins the Arabian Sea. So this fact becomes important with respect to Kali River. Thus this news becomes a very important news from our prelims as well as mains perspective. And in your mains, this topic gets covered under GS paper 3 in environment. With this, let's move on to our next news discussion. The next news appears on page number 9. It says, panel approves scheme to trade in forest. It allows forest department to outsource reforesting to non-government agencies. Now the forest advisory committee has approved of a scheme known as green credit scheme, which allows forest to be traded as a commodity and in the process it also allows the forest department to outsource one of its important responsibility with respect to reforesting to non-government agencies. Now let us understand that system as compared to what is being followed presently. As of now if a forest land is acquired by an industry then the industry must compensate by finding appropriate non-forest land which is equal to that part of land which was raised. Suppose this is a forest land and this particular area has been occupied by an industry. So the industry must compensate first of all by finding an appropriate non-forest land which is equal to that part of land which was raised or which was acquired in the forest area. Then the industry must also pay the state department with respect to current economic equivalent of forest land which is represented by net present value of such forest land. So in this regard industries have complained that they find it hard to acquire appropriate non-forest land which has to be contiguous to an existing forest and because of this most of the amount which have been given by these industries have been collected by the center but not been spent by state forest department. So nearly around rupees 50,000 crore has been collected by the center over decades. So these funds were lying unspent as the states were not spending the money on regrowing forest or on afforestation activities. The Supreme Court also intervened and a new law came about with rules for how this fund should be administered for regrowing the forest and around rupees 47,000 crore has been dispersed to states until August but it has barely led to any regeneration of forest area. So in this regard the green credit scheme allows agencies which can be private companies, village forest communities etc to identify land and also begin growing plantations. And after three years, they would be eligible to be considered as compensatory forest land if they meet department's criteria. So as of now, this is a developing story. So let's wait for the final outcome with respect to this particular news. Now with respect to your prelims examination, you must remember that Forest Advisory Committee has been reconstituted under Forest Conservation Act of 1980. So this topic becomes important from your prelims perspective in the environment section. The next news appears on page number 9. It says UP tops list in crimes against women. And this data has been published by NCRB that is National Crime Records Bureau which functions under the Ministry of Home Affairs. And NCRB has published Crime in India report of 2018. So as per the report crime against women has increased and the state of Uttar Pradesh has seen the maximum cases of crime against women. Now of all the crime against women conviction rate in rape related cases have been at 27.2% cases of cruelty by husband or relatives has been recorded at 31.9% and cases of assault on women with intent to outrage modesty has been recorded at 27.6% of the total crimes against women. Now in this case, rate of filing charge sheet by police has been at around 85.3%. Now all these data becomes important as you can quote these data while writing your answers and also in your essays if such a topic appears in the examination. 
Now with respect to suicides, there has been an increase of 3.6% with respect to cases of suicides. And of the total number of suicides taken place in India, 7.7% .7 of the suicides were from those people who were working in the farm sector. Further, maximum suicide was committed by daily wagers and this was at 22.4%. And majority of these suicides have been recorded in the state of Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, West Bengal, Madhya Pradesh and Karnataka. Now the Hindu newspaper also highlights about the suicides committed in 2018. It says that as many as 30,127 daily wage earners committed suicide in the year 2018. And this has been highest among all professions. The number of suicides among persons engaged in agriculture however came down by 2.9% in the year 2018 as compared to last year that is 2017. So the percentage of suicides with respect to profession has been daily wage earner the suicide rate has been at 22.4% for housewife it has been at 17.1% for student it has been at 7.6% for farmers or cultivators it has been at 4.3% and for agricultural labor it has been at 3.4%. So considering these aspects, the government can now frame suitable policies to tackle this problem of suicides being committed by different sections of the society. Now with respect to riot cases, riot due to communal, political, agrarian as well as caste conflict has seen a decline as compared to 2017. However, Cases of industrial rights and rights with respect to water disputes have increased significantly. As you can see, the cases of industrial rights were 178 in 2017 and this has significantly increased to 440 in 2018. Similarly, for cases of rights with respect to water disputes, the cases in 2017 was 432 but in 2018 it has increased to 838. So here we can see that industrial rights and water disputes have become a major concern for the government to address especially with respect to cases of rights. Now the report mentions that while the cases of communal rights have witnessed a decline as compared to last year, cases of attempts at inciting passions and stoking hatred have increased. Further, the data also shows that offenses promoting enmity between different groups have been constantly rising and have in fact more than doubled as compared to 2016. So these become some of the important statistics with respect to suicide as well as cases of riots. Thus this topic becomes important with respect to the latest data given by NCRB on crime in India for the year 2018. This topic gets covered under GS paper 2 specifically with respect to welfare schemes for vulnerable section of the population by center and states as well as issues relating to development and management of social sector such as health, education as well as human resources. With this, let's move on to our next news discussion. Now the next news appears as an interview on page number 11. It says, what is the state of open source in India today? It is the new normal but we still need to go a long way to adopt open source tools in big data. Now this is an extract of interview with respect to open source code in India. So in this backdrop, so in this backdrop, this interview highlights about open source movement in India which has focused on democratizing technology access and also its relevance to digital technology, privacy as well as software patenting. So let us understand what the interviewers have tried to highlight it with respect to open source code in India. Now to understand the backdrop of this debate, first of all we need to understand certain basic terms such as property software, open source software and source code. So first of all let us start our understanding of source code. Now source code is a form in which computer program is written by humans using a programming language. Further, it is necessary to have a source code as it helps in modifying or improving the computer program. 
So in the backdrop of source code, there are two important aspects. One is open source software and the other is proprietary software. Now the important point to be understood is that proprietary software is not free. It is generally owned by any company or organization. It is patented or copyrighted and its source code is always a secret. That is people cannot modify, enhance or inspect the source code of a proprietary software. Whereas with respect to open source software, it is generally a free software and has very minimal or very less restrictions and people can actually modify, inspect as well as enhance its source code. So it is in this backdrop that this article has highlighted about the open source movement or open source software movement in India whereby the software engineers have started using open source software whose source code can be easily modified, inspected or enhanced as compared to a proprietary software whose source code is a secret and cannot be enhanced or modified. So in this regard, the open source software movement is a movement that supports use of open source licenses for some or all of software. And this is done as a part of broader notion of open collaboration. Further, the open source movement was started to spread the concept or idea of open source software. So open source projects, products or initiative embrace and celebrate principles of open exchange, collaborative participation, transparency, meritocracy, as well as community oriented development. Whereas proprietary software is any software that is copyrighted and can be limited with respect to use, distribution, as well as modification. Further, proprietary software, also known as closed source software, is a non-free computer software. So to use proprietary software, one needs to pay heavily to its license holder in the form of copyright or patent. So after understanding the basics about open source software movement, this interview highlights various aspects. So let us go through these different aspects one by one. First of all, it mentions that there was a need for an open source software in the early 2000, where the interview said that there was a need to campaign aggressively for open source for political, cultural and economic reasons. But now open source has become the new normal. Further, the open source movement helped new age startups and business ventures in the software industry. And this also helped them to become technology independent. And it also ensured that software was localized to Indian languages. Now all these helped in saving cost as it reduced dependency on MNCs for core technology like operating systems. So today some of the largest e-governance projects and startups in India are running on open source. Further, the open source gives software developers as well as the industry a whole lot of diversity with respect to choosing either the open source software or proprietary software and also the ability to either stay with open source software or to choose heavy price tag MNCs. Now this interview highlights that open source software could not develop earlier because of lack of fixing technical issues in OS software. However, now with democratization of technologies, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, open source software has become much more of a mainstream idea. Further, commercial use of open source has ensured its sustainability such as use of OS in mission critical application like stock exchange or e-government application. And all these has played a major role in boosting the adoption of open source overall now. So the pace of innovation in open source because of its collaborative nature outstrips that in proprietary software. So if one looks at the current areas of explosive growth such as big data and analytics then the pace of innovation in open source is so rapid that there is no proprietary competitor. And now we are in the era of 
OS20, where the technology seems to have leapfrogged proprietary software for the use of mobile phone in the hands of an estimated 800 million people is also reducing or removing the fear of technology from people's mind and mobile phone is the first computing device that has been introduced to the new generation. So with the use of internet in India becoming cheaper, consumption of online content is also changing including more number of online content being generated for purposes other than entertainment that is for the purpose of healthcare and education. Further, more number of videos are now being uploaded on YouTube channel and all these developments are relevant for open source software coding. So there is a continuous need for skill enhancement and this must be aided by academia, industry as well as government with respect to open source coding. Further, with more number of content being generated online, there is a hope that use of open source coding will develop and nurture more in times to come, including some built locally for India as well. So we can say that in this regard, many of these entertainment apps which have been developed plays a major role in removing the fear of technology from people's mind. And this also helps overall in the development of open source code system in the country. Now with respect to debates around software patenting, the multinational companies continue to be the biggest patentees in India and with their increasing grip over new technologies such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, internet of things, big data, 5G etc there will be pressure on the Indian government to allow for software patenting in India. Now it's important to note that as per the Patents Act of 1970, software patent in India is not allowed. As you can see that section 3 of Patents Act 1970 states that what are not inventions? It mentions that the following shall not be invention within the meaning of this act. And under clause K, it mentions about a mathematical or business method or a computer program per se or algorithms. So the law says that software per se is not patentable. But the interpretation of this word per se has been twisted by various institutions and this game has been going on for years. So basically the word per se in this act creates a lot of confusion with respect to patenting of software in India. In this regard, it's interesting to note that the intent of parliament was that software should not be patentable. However, the multinational companies want software to be patentable because this is the law in the United States. And in this regard, we will continue to see pushback by multinational companies because there are the largest patent holders anywhere in the world and balance of power and software patentees is with them as of now. So in this regard, the Indian government might face a legal challenge with respect to software patentee. More these MNCs get grip over new technologies such as artificial intelligence, machine learning, IoT, big data, etc. And more we are getting dependent on these companies using latest technologies the government of India will be more obliged to obey by their rules. So in this regard, patenting of software will become another major issue in times to come. So patenting of software in India, especially with respect to open source code becomes a very problematic area because if patents are allowed in India for software, then patent developers will be able to charge royalties from domestic software technology players. And in this regard, we can say that there are billions of dollars at stake for this and it is never going to be easy unless, as per the interview, the Indian government removes this word per se from Section 3K of Indian Patents Act of 1970. So in this regard, India needs to invest heavily in building its own intellectual property. And that means that we need to have our own patents. As in United States, everything innovated under the sun is patentable 
and in this regard india needs to become patent competitive as patenting of new technology will play a major role in times to come now another aspect dealt in this interview is with respect to concerns on data it highlights software developers in india must be able to build a system where individuals can take control of their own data and also should be in control as to how other people monetize data and leverage it for various purposes such as loans etc so in this regard this article says that in the world of artificial intelligence in every field privacy of data will be another major challenge not only for the consumers but also for the government and in this regard the government of india should seriously look forward to pass the data protection bill so in this regard this article says that the issue of data privacy must also be looked into seriously by data developers or software developers as it says that data privacy issue requires every creator to build trust and this trust will become an important feature for any data led industry as we move forward in time and technology so overall it is here where open source code software can play a major role in increasing data safety but for this to happen the government needs to build more trust not only with os developers that is developers of this open source software but also with the consumers of such data article effectively ends by saying that the government has two roles in this regard first the law makers has to ensure that they pass laws that benefit citizens and here we are referring to the data protection bill and second and the most important aspect is that that even the government is one of the largest controllers and consumers of data so what kind of data governance this system or this country adopts is going to be really critical part of data ecosystem in india so this article becomes very important from the perspective of science and technology under gs paper 3 and also from the perspective of data governance under gs paper 2 now after a discussion these are your practice questions for the day question number 1 which of the following statements about pyrolysis is are correct first it is a chemical decomposition of organic materials through application of heat in the presence of oxygen now the statement is incorrect as it takes place in the absence of oxygen next rate of pyrolysis decreases with increase in temperature no rate of pyrolysis increases with increase in temperature so this statement is also incorrect third pyrolysis is an exothermic reaction no pyrolysis is an endothermic reaction so the question is select the correct answer using the code given below so here none of the above statements are correct so the correct answer is d that is none of the above question number 2 consider the following statements first biochar reduces soil fertility and carbon sequestration no this is incorrect as biochar increases soil fertility as well as its ability of carbon sequestration second bio oil is produced through fast pyrolysis whereby temperature is increased at a very high rate per second yes this is correct as temperature is increased at a rate of 1000 degrees celsius per second third treatment of sludge is an industrial application of pyrolysis yes this statement is correct fourth in pyrolysis higher alkanes get converted into lower alkanes and alkenes yes this is also correct as we have seen in our discussion so the question is which of the statement given above is our correct so here the correct answer would be a that is 2 3 and 4 only now moving on to practice question number 3 it says consider the following statements about state of goa first river mahadai flows through goa yes this is correct second it does not have a declared wildlife sanctuary no this is incorrect as it does not have a declared tiger reserve third mahadai tiger reserve is situated in goa no the statement is incorrect so the question is which of the statements given above is are incorrect so here 2 and 3 are incorrect so here b becomes a correct answer moving on to question number 4 consider the following statements about crime in india 2018 report released by ncrb first crime against women has decreased as compared to 2017 
Now, this statement is incorrect as crime against women has increased. Second, cases of industrial rights and rights related to water disputes have increased significantly. Yes, this is correct as such cases has increased more than two times. Third, maximum number of suicide was committed by daily wage earners. Yes, this is correct as approx 22.7% of number of suicides took place by the daily wage earners. So the question is, which of the statements given above is a correct? So here, 2 and 3 are correct. So the correct answer is C, that is 2 and 3 only. With this, we come to an end to discussion of today's newspaper. Let's move on to our question for the day.